now we are in the generative AI era. Mm -hmm. Hackers are going to hack a lot of platforms around the world. And with financial services, I see an opportunity where we are going to integrate the APIs to secure the globe. Hello, welcome back to the DevSec Voice. Today, we're talking about secure code practices and network automation with Belen Muhungu, uh, who was recognized as a Cisco top talent in Sub-Saharan Africa during the 2016 NetWriters IT competition. So we're super excited to have here, him back here today. Uh, he's been in the game for nearly 10 years now, working as a self-taught freelance network technician in Congo. And uh, he's quite literally one of the faces of Cisco DevNet, uh, producing content and providing encouragement around network automation, penetration based testing, and uh, secure code practices. Uh, he also speaks three languages. He's a man of many talents, reads books, listens to lo-fi music on sunny days, and learns German. So uh, thank you for being here, Elaine. Thanks for having me, Erika. Uh, like I said, you're the face of DevNet, so I have just been waiting for our first opportunity to actually sit down and chat face to face and, and share some of the work you've been doing. Yes, I am ready to share all my experience. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, so, like I said, I think what is really great about the work you're doing is you really sit at the intersection of a lot of different topics. Um, and so I've dove into some of your Hacker Noon articles, um, some of the content you've been sharing online, and just wanted to talk a little bit about your journey into uh, secure coding and network automation and um, what recommendations you would give to people in this field. If that sounds great to you. Yes, I started my journey in Congo. I live in a small town called Lubumbashi, formerly known as Elizabethville. I remember it was difficult for me as a student to start the NetAgrad program because it was not elevated. My education program did not allow me to start early. So I had to start after 10 years. And I remember in summer 2015, I started my journey with that. It was an static journey, learning with a Linksys router, a Cisco router. <laughs> Packet Tracer and Cisco Aspire. It was one of my first experiences in networking. And when I was learning, I was reading some blogs online, Cisco blogs. I remember sometimes reading blogs by Wendell O'Don and all the brand Cisco Press, all the brand Cisco Press writers. But when I was learning, I, I was super interested in connecting things, how to connect routers and switches. And to start, my first experience started with Cisco Packet Tracer. I started with Cisco Packet Tracer. <laughs> After Cisco Packet Tracer, I started to learn with GNS3. From GNS3, I went to Cisco Aspire. From Cisco Aspire, I started to learn with real networking equipment. And when I was learning, I used to read some, some blogs, even some provision by former Cisco CEO, John Chambers. Oh, yeah, yeah. They said, yes, they said maybe in the coming years, in, in 10 years, we are, going to, we are going to move from network to automation. And for me, it was an opportunity to learn. And from 2015 to 2016, I was already a Cisco net writer in Sub-Saharan Africa. It was an opportunity for me to learn and go ahead with networking. As soon as I was learning, it was also an opportunity for me to start with automation. But it was super difficult for me to start with automation because I was not major. Yeah. So, so what did that look like? So you, you had the spark of interest in networking and you saw automation as an opportunity, but um, what did you use uh, to get into automation and actually know what you were doing? Like, was it, Cisco Network Academy resources that taught you how to do automation and learn Python or something else? Yes, uh, my first, I remember in 2020 when COVID-19 shook the world, I had a plan to go to South Africa to join a friend. Unfortunately, it was difficult to go there. So I decided to stay at home 
when I decided to stay home, I joined the Cisco Learning Network. It was a great opportunity for me to meet different people from all over the world. And DevNet was in my plan. I remember when DevNet was created, I was super young and not major to start with automation. So I had to wait, I had to be patient. But in 2020, I decided to start with DevNet. Prior to DevNet, I had the opportunity to learn with different network jails, IoT stuff like Adafruit, uh, Raspberry Pi. I had to learn with many things. And in 2020, I decided to start with Cisco DevNet. It was in February. And thanks to Cisco DevNet, I had the opportunity to learn Python, to discover automation, to discover Docker, uh, Git, uh, all the things I didn't know before. It's thanks to Cisco DevNet. You know what? You, you made an interesting comment, um, which is that Cisco, Cisco DevNet just celebrated their 10 year anniversary. So you've really been here for the whole DevNet journey, uh, you know, in, in a way, right? How, how has DevNet, I think, uh, how has DevNet changed, in your opinion, to meet the needs of the network engineering and IT community? Uh, to me, Cisco DevNet is changing. I remember when Suzy Wee was present, we are DevNet create, we are all the interesting events. And after Suzy Wee, we had Grace Francisco, of San Francisco, we went from DevNet create to Cisco develop. And for me, Cisco DevNet is changing the way we have to learn automation, thanks to a plethora of content. You have all the content. Sometimes I say you don't have to Google, you just have to DevNet. Nice, I like that. Make that into a verb. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have to DevNet. Awesome. So, you know, and this is, this journey of yours is, is winding, right? Because you started with network engineering, got super psyched about automation, um, but now you also specialize in penetration testing and secure code practices. So how, how did you jump also into security? Yes, you know, uh, I always observe how the industry changed daily. Yes, I always observe how the industry changed daily. I remember back in 2015, we had the opportunity to learn all the time with Cisco chairs connecting cables, using the console cable all the time. But I remember one day I was reading the book, Who Moved My Cheese? The book was shared by Cisco. And that book changed my life because change is something we, can, we cannot escape. I know today you can have networking, tomorrow we can have automation. As soon as networking get, getting bigger daily, we have to jump to automation. It was an opportunity for me to know, okay, now I know how to connect things. What if I work in a bigger network? If I work in a bigger network, I have to learn automation. That's why I started to learn automation. And after learning automation, I knew that as soon as the world is connected daily, uh, the bad guys, we are black hat hackers. Black hat hackers can hack all the networks, no matter the complexity we have. They can hack the networks all the time. And for me, it was an opportunity to start with pen testing. But before starting with pen testing, I started to learning Linux. And Linux was a great starting point for me to, to love the, the world of pen testing. And after pen testing, I had also the opportunity to learn secure coding practices. But it was also thanks to Cisco DevNet during. Oh, so many nice words about Cisco DevNet. <laughs> I appreciate yes. that. Yes, it was. During Cisco Live uh, 2021, we had captured the flag. After, ca after capture the flag, I was super inspired to, to learn more about security. And thanks to the experience I have now with APIs, it was possible for me to, to learn different vendors, how they create the APIs, how they write the documentation. And for me, it was like, okay, Marlene, you have the opportunity to shine. You have everything in your hand. That's funny. So you, I feel like you're really a great person to, because of your experience, to uh, give people an overview of what code security looks like in network automation, right? Because you really understand 
the full circle of, of topics here. Um, so I just, I just want to start picking your brain about some of the knowledge that you've been sharing with other folks. What have you seen that, that needs to be secured in code? Yes, I know uh, Python is the de facto language of automation. And all the time we have to write scripts to automate different tasks we can have daily. But as soon as we write the script, it's difficult for a developer who is not experienced in security to know if the code is secure or not. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And once this developer does not know how to secure the code, someone around the globe can learn to exploit. Yeah. All, yes. This is why I started to learn automation. I completely agree with you because I talked about uh, in some other podcast how, you know, I, I got my master's in software engineering and it wasn't emphasized there either, right? It, code security is kind of something you just fall into or you're required to do by your company. And, and it seems like so many of us never get the importance and formal training, you know, of, okay, how do I actually write secure code? Um, do you see that... Uh, do you see resistance from network engineers when it comes to secure code practices, or do you think that network engineers kind of understand and appreciate code security? Yes, I know. Uh, I remember during Cisco Live in 2021, I had the opportunity to learn secure coding practices with the Australian platform Secure Code Warrior. It was an opportunity for me to discover how we can act, but I know that the challenge was super difficult for me. <laughs> After two rounds, I was already eliminated. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And I see the resistance in the industry. Today, for me, uh, most of network engineers don't want to, to go beyond what they know. They only want to work on the traditional networking. They want to CLI. CLI, too much yeah. CLIs, too much keystrokes, <laughs> cabling. But for me, uh, they have to, to observe how the industry is changing. We went from the CLI, now we have automation. After automation, now we are going to the generative AI trend. They have to adapt. If they cannot, if they cannot adapt, it will be difficult for us to, to yeah, do absolutely. Yes. And now AI, right? Yes, yeah, now we have AI. So I, I've seen you sharing a lot on just general AI topics too, right? Like, you know, trends in AI and AI ethics and all that. Uh, and you're always ahead of the game. I always see you. You're always studying and learning. Um, what, what have you been studying AI related since all this hit the scene? <laughs> yes. Uh, after Cisco Live 20, uh, 2024, I was inspired by the partnership between Cisco and NVIDIA. And for me, it was an opportunity to start learning LLMs. I know this is where we're going to be networking. And I think LLM are going to help a lot uh, junior engineers, maybe senior engineers in the future. That's why I started to, to learn NVIDIA. And I'm super interested to learn NVIDIA for DevOps. Mm hmm 100%. Do you think that we're going to see that same resistance in learning AI, too? Do you think that this is just another layer of resistance? For yes. yes, we went from automation, now we have AI, and even when I go online, I see the resistance, I am a network engineer, I don't have to learn AI, it knows my, my domain, but the only thing I know there, is, there are bad side and good side, but the only thing I know, AI is going to change a lot of things in nature. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's going to change a lot of things in nature, and nature engineers should learn even the basics. Sure. I mean, I think even just AI tools, you know what I mean? Even if you're, you're, you don't want to dive into uh, LLMs and understanding the ins and outs, mm -hmm. I mean, I think AI tools are going to be everywhere. Yes. I know uh, maybe currently people are afraid to use generative AI tools. It's true because uh, the IP is still going on. But for me, we should go now from the IP to trust. 
if we don't trust generative AI tools, it will be difficult for different vendors to, to sell even to ship the apps. We have a plethora of apps today. If you go on LinkedIn, uh, here is the list of 500 generative AI to use. It's good, but beyond the hype, for me, we should go from hype to trust. If you don't trust generative AI tools, it will be difficult for us to use them. Yeah, no, definitely. Do you think that any of that is fear? Because I know, you know, when automation came about, people were scared about losing jobs. Do you think that that's part of the resistance now with AI? Yes, I think uh, with automation, automation was not there to replace the workforce. It was there to empower the workforce with a new way of doing things. And this is the same with AI. AI is here to empower us. And I think next year I'm going to bring some stickers narrowed it by AI. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Now, uh, are they going to be legit stickers or are they going to be like the funny stickers where AI just says something completely crazy? Yes, I'm going okay. to. Just, <laughs> it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. I think network engineers should learn the basics of AI. The ways of changing. Even when we learn AI, I observe another trend. The other trend is the more we use generative AI tools, the more attacks we are going to have in the future. And this mm -hmm. is where secure coders are going to shine in the future, maybe in five or 10 years. Yeah, no, I, uh, I was going to send you one of these, but I, I was on the same train of thought. This is one of the stickers I gave out at Cisco Live, the AI powered, not replaced, uh, for people who can't see the video. Um, no, no, I, I'm all about it. I can't wait to see your uh, your AI stickers. Yes, I'm going to bring. <laughs> Are you going to bring them to Cisco Live to the next? Yes, I'm yeah. going to come to the next in San Diego. You're going to be at San Diego, yay! That's I'm so excited. I mean, that's a whole year away, but I'm so excited. Um, I another okay. So we're gonna. I want to transition a little bit. I know that you are a community advocate for Pangea. Yeah. Could you tell listeners a little bit about Pangea and what they do and, and what you're doing for them? Yes, Pangea is a great security company coming from Palo Alto. They come with a set of APIs to help uh, developers who don't know security on a high level how they can integrate the APIs into the hypes. With Pangea, you don't have to be a senior security professional to use the APIs. All you have to do is to integrate the APIs in your app or platform you are building based on your need. They offer a set of APIs on reduction. You have bring up APIs. You have some APIs on file intelligence, how to scan the files you have in your uh, in your folder and so on. I know Pangea is changing a little bit the world now with the services and it's GDPR driven. Uh, so as a community advocate, are you teaching people how to use these APIs or what does that look like? Yes, as a community advocate for Pangea, I promote the services, what they do, if they have some half cartons. I remember last year, I had the opportunity to, to code in one week with a friend who lives in Bangalore. And we met after a publication I posted on LinkedIn. After the publication, we went on WhatsApp. And from WhatsApp, we started to, to build a network management platform to use in Bangalore. And we use Pangea services. Oh, that's awesome. I love it. Um, so what made you, what made Pangea stand out to you where you were like, yes, like this is this is what I want to promote? Yes. Uh, you know, as a security person, I am passionate about security. When I saw Pangea the first time, it was thanks to Grace Francisco. Yes. When I went on LinkedIn, I already paused. Uh, we can redact data with Pangea APIs. And for me, it was, oh, now we are... Now we are in the generative AI era. Mm -hmm. Hackers are going to hack a lot of platforms around the world. 
And with financial services, I see an opportunity where we are going to integrate the APIs to secure the globe. That's why I was a, a fan, a great fan. And then I started to advocate for the community. And is this free? Are these APIs free and publicly available to people? Or is it a subscription? Yes, there is a subscription. And there are also a free version where people can test APIs, if you want, for example, to read, how to read out data, how to scan files, yes, and they use different technologies. Would you recommend them for beginners? Because we do have a lot of uh, network automators in the community who are just getting comfortable. Do you think this is pretty beginner friendly to use? Yes, it's beginner friendly because the documentation is not difficult to read. And once you read the documentation, you'll understand where we are going with the generative AI era and NGA is there to secure the globe. Oh man, you made me excited to truck in <laughs> um, <laughs> So um, what, what other uh, tools do you find yourself using um, in your network automation journey and more specifically your security journey? Like we know about Pangea, you promote Pangea. Are there, are there any other tools you find yourself using? No, I have. Uh, I don't have a lot of tools I use. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everything? I know. Um, even when I am at the intersections of different fields, I know where to learn and what I don't have to learn because it's difficult to handle a lot of topics at the same time. When you learn AI, when you learn, you just have to know that okay, if I'm a network person, I have just to learn. AI related to networking. If I am a database person, I have to learn AI related. It's difficult to master everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. What about uh, DevNet resources? You don't. You don't have to boost my ego or anybody else's ego here. But what what DevNet resources do you think have been the most helpful for automation? Yes, uh, I started with the Miraki documentation. You have all the APIs. And you have Cisco DNA. Cisco DNA was super inspiring for me. Um, you have Cisco Fire, Fire Management Center. Yeah. yeah. It was super important for me. And they, uh, what makes different DevNet with different companies is the way they write the documentation. The documentation is mm. written. Even if you are not a professional, as a beginner, it will be easy for you if you are patient to go step by step with the with the content provided. And do you, when you're doing automation, do you typically just rely on using Python, or are you ever using like Ansible or Terraform? Or I know everybody's got a different stack. Mm, personally, I didn't work with Terraform, but I remember when I started my journey, John Capobianco sent me a book. Okay, I have a book, and the best way to start automation, you have to start with Ansible. Yes, when I was learning Ansible, I used to write sometimes some some blog posts on LinkedIn, and I remember one day, Ant Preston told me, "Man, you don't have to focus all the time on Ansible. Uh -huh. Ansible yeah. Yes, Ansible is great, but you you have to go ahead. That's why I started to improve my learning with Python. But I know Python is great. JavaScript. Mm. <laughs> I'm not a JavaScript <laughs> fan either. I hate JavaScript. Yes, JavaScript is like Chinese for me sometimes. <laughs> okay. Yes, Python is the great way to start automation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, what about um, one of your articles that I enjoyed uh, was on shift left testing. So for, for people that don't know what that is, it's just testing code that's, t sorry, testing that your code is secure early on in the development process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, find and fix bugs as early as possible. Um, I know that there's a lot of opinions on, you know, whether we should be shifting left, um, but could you just describe how you typically talk about testing your automation uh, to people? Like, what, what do people need to know about actually Shifting left. Yes, I know. Uh, the trend I see now online is 
with the generative AI era, everybody wants to ship application. It's like a race now. We are in the race track. We have to ship. We have to ship. We have to ship. Yeah. yeah. When you read some reports online, for example, from, from IBM, they say the cost of a cybersecurity breach in 2022 was four million. Wow. And for, yes. And for me, if you don't secure your code, you don't know how to write secure code, it will be difficult to go ahead in the industry. That's why I remember one day I was watching a, a talk by Grace Francisco, Chief Left Testing. Uh -huh. I was, yes, I was super curious to learn about the topic. And I remember in the Pangea community, uh, most of the time they, they write article on Chief Left Testing. And for me, it was an opportunity. And then I went on Cisco DevNet. <laughs> okay. DevNet is, yes, DevNet is my Google. I went on DevNet and they said, uh, is security cost more than security? I, I know, I, I always love your DevNet energy, so ha have at it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and then I I started to learn shift left testing. And for me, the biggest part in software development is not the code you write. That's why when I read one day a book, they also say software development does not start in your IDE, it starts in your brain. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we yeah. security. Yes. That's why every time I discuss with developers on social platforms, I always advise them to, to start their software development in their brain before writing the code. I know. Mm -hmm. The generative AI now is here is like a race. We have to ship, we have to ship, we have to ship. And as soon as we don't ship, as soon as we don't secure your code, it will be difficult to to shine in the industry. You may lose your reputation. That's why choosing shift left testing is a great way to go because the security starts first in your brain before starting in your IDE. No, I know a fantastic mindset to have uh, because I think a lot of people just want to immediately start writing code and maybe even without even thinking about what it is they're trying to accomplish or how they want to accomplish it. But it really does come down to being mindful and intentional, I think, like you mentioned. Uh, but I will say I, I like using paper. I can't, uh, I can't just think about it. I can't keep it all up here. I, I do kind of a whiteboard or piece of paper situation and it looks like a, you know, mad scientist, crazy person trying to sort out their ideas. Um, but, but I think that's part of the process, right? I think that's part of uh, planning your code security. Yes, it's super important. It's super important. Mm -hmm. um, are there any like frameworks or tools or best practices that you've seen in industry being used for shift left testing? Or do you think this is somewhat unexplored? Yes, for me, uh, as a definite person, I know shift left, testing, shift left testing is the way to go. I know there are different processes we can use today in software development, but for me, the best way is to start with shift left testing. And I read some document from the Pentagon. They say developers should build today apps or platform with a secure by design approach. If you don't build your app with a secure by design approach, it will be difficult for people to trust you in the future. As soon as we are going to have more attacks. Do you, uh, would you mind explaining just a little bit what the secure by design approach is? Because I think that's probably probably new for a lot of people. Yes, when they say secure by design approach, it means the security should start at the bottom of the software development life cycle. At each layer you have to secure your, your code. If you can secure, it will be difficult for you once you have a cyber attack, it will be difficult because the work will be huge. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, I'm trying to, right? Uh, okay, I, I have another question. I, I, I lose track of, of the things I want to ask you. Um, going back to AI, uh, do you think that AI is going to make securing code harder or easier? I just kind of wanted to pick your brain. 
<laughs> it's a challenging question. I know um, it's going to be tough for people with less experience. But I know even if people with higher experience, for example, senior developers, I think they are going to rely on powerful tools. Maybe I hope in the future we are going to have some tools where senior developers are going to work to secure code. But for beginners, it's going to be challenging to secure the code in the generative AI. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And when you say it's going to be challenging, is that because we don't know how to secure? Yes, it's going to be challenging because you don't know how to secure. And I know as soon as you have more users, once you have a cyber attack, it's not easy to recover from it. Well, and there's a lot of concerns too about whether or not even using these AI assistants and tools is secure in of itself. I, I don't know if you hear a lot of, of that in the industry, but um, I remember at Cisco Live, a lot of people being really interested in, in uh, using LLMs or like in my case, AI coding assistants. Uh, but there's always that, that percentage of people that says, well, how can we trust you know, how they're using our data and what data they're collecting. Yes, that's why uh, I said in the beginning, we have to go from the eye to trust now. If people have less trust, it's going to be difficult to use all the generative AI tools we want. Yeah, no, exactly. And uh, I remember uh, I shared with a couple folks, you know, because these tools have responsible AI policies now. And so, you know, people will ask, you know, like, what data are they collecting? And I'll be like, well, this is their policy. This is what they state that you opt into. And they're like, oh, no, I don't believe it. You know, so it really is that lack of trust. You know, it's, it's that, okay, well, we, we don't care what they say they're doing. You know. Yes. Uh, the funny thing is, now I'm comparing the generative AI trends to remote work, you know, with remote mm. work. If you don't trust someone, it's difficult to work with him. This is where we are going with the generative AI tools. If we don't trust in the generative AI tools, it will be difficult for people to use them in the long run. I hope maybe in one, two, or three years, the AI mm -hmm. puts. Do you uh, do you think that the responsibility is on these companies to earn trust, or do you think it's just us being afraid of? Ah, you know, AI taking over the world, you know. <laughs> yes, I think the responsibility should start with companies. They have to tell people clearly how they collect the data and how they secure them. Once people understand how they are secured, it will be easy for them to, to trust all the companies. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, and I think probably proving it too, right? Because I know like with Copilot, um, you know, Microsoft put... Copilot and PCs. I don't know if you saw that big news scandal about, oh, they're continuously taking screenshots and some of the screenshots had passwords and sensitive data. And so, you know, then this product that everyone was really excited about, people lost a lot of trust in, I think, because of that one incident. So I, I really think that, the, that proving it and having a good track record Yes, maybe, <laughs> I, I think uh, during the generative AI era now, we are maybe take whistleblowers now. They are there to, to share some warnings, but the second problem is, is it true or false? We don't know the reality if the companies are collecting all the sensitive data we need. But I think in Europe, they have their own framework, the, G the GDPR framework. But in different countries, they they have to develop theirs too. Um, absolutely. Uh, how do you see network engineers using AI in the future? Like if you want to look like 10, 20 years into the future, what role does AI play? Yes, I think in five years, maybe 10 years, we are going to troubleshoot networks, even complex networks with LLMs. I think we are doing, maybe I'm going to write a documentation in our company for junior developers. Then I can take the 
documentation, I can send it to the LLMs, the LLMs can learn the data, and then even if I'm absent, the junior engineer can learn asking questions to the LLM, basic question. I hope AI is going to change network engineering in 10 years. Yeah, no, the learning, I think, is one of the biggest things I've already seen even today is, especially if you're using the right model or assistant for your use case, right? Like, how convenient is it that you can, uh, you know, prompt this uh, model versus do constant Google searches, you know, having to buy books, whatever, right? Um I mean, they're already fairly reliable, in my opinion, for learning, despite all the jokes. People joke about things like Google Gemini, but not all the models are made equally. <laughs> yes, there is a challenge now. We have a set of models coming each month. And for Black Hat hackers, they are still learning how to exploit them. This is why I am worried about the future of the generative AI tools. I know AI was was there, but with chat GPT coming in the market, we went from the hype now, we need more trust. Well, it's evolving really quickly. And, yes. I, and uh, I think that uh, even companies that are resisting using AI now, they're being forced to reckon with the fact that a lot of the services and vendors they're using are still going to use AI. I mean, Cisco is um, creating the AI assistance in our products, right? Um, we're coming out with AI assistant for security. And, you know, if you are an AI averse company, you might not like that now your firepower management center has an AI assistant. You know, you might have a lot of questions. <laughs> yes. I think we have to worry less. As soon as we are going to have a skilled workforce in the future, it's going to be possible for us to work with trust. The lack of trust today is because we have a less skilled workforce, especially in secure coding practices. Once we have a good workforce, it's going to be easy for people to, to trust all the tools they use, the company, they, they pay services. This is how I see the generative AI trend in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you keep mentioning this, this resistance, right? Like resistance to trust, resistance to learning, all, all these things. What is the answer, Verlaine? What is the answer to this resistance? The answer to this resistance is to adapt. <laughs> Just do it. <laughs> yes, I know we, we have to adapt. Change is inevitable in the industry. Yes. I remember in 2015, we used to work with cables all the time, console cable, equipment by equipment. Now we have automation. Now it's AI. I think network engineers should adapt. Yes. Mm -hmm. Adaptability is key in the industry. And I know they don't have to do all the work. We have secure coders, we have developers. They don't have to get worried all the time. I actually, I have seen some instances, especially at Cisco Live, actually, of software developers who were being asked to learn network engineering, you know, going <laughs> kind of the other way around. Uh, I don't know if you've seen a lot of that, um, but the, the people that I met at Cisco Live doing that, they seem pretty enthusiastic about it, about the opportunity. So I'm kind of interested to see how we bridge that gap? Yes. Um, I think the resistance continues now in the industry. I know uh, for network engineers, when you talk about coding, development, they feel like get replaced. Some are frustrated. Yeah. But I know the future of network engineering will also depend on how network engineers will adapt and how they will shift from Cabling, to automation, from automation to security. I think if we have full stack developers today, in five or 10 years, we're going to have full stack network engineers. Oh, man. Yes. They have to <laughs> Some people are not happy to hear you say that. Um, so 
so what what does that skill set look like then? You know, you've got traditional in the CLI networking. Mm -hmm. What does the skill stack look like, in your opinion, for a network engineer today if they want to be on top of these trends and competitive? Yes, I know. Uh, for the full stack network engineer, uh, they should learn first. Uh, they should improve first networking skills. After networking skills, we have network automation, and they don't have to be experts to, to learn automation. After automation, they have to learn AI, how we use generative AI in troubleshooting, knowledge base, how to build a knowledge base for your company. And then they should learn secure coding practices. I know the new network engineer learn how to write scripts. And once they write scripts, they should also learn how to secure the script. Mm -hmm. This is how I see the full stack engineer now. Next week, full stack engineer. Um, I pretty much agree with you. I, I would maybe put the secure coding like eh, like at the same as AI or, or something or before, but I pretty much agree with you. Uh, and I get asked that a lot uh, on LinkedIn. There's a lot of folks going into network engineering today that say, "I'm so confused." Mm -hmm. We're supposed to know all these different skills, like where do I start and how am I going to learn all this? And I think you kind of summed up what that pathway looks like really nicely. Um, yes. what, what about things like, uh, you know, thrown into the mix are things like, you know, containerization, mm -hmm. and SED practices, and, and Terraform, and, you know, um, do you think that all of these are skills that you just kind of add on as you go? How do you view it? Um, in my opinion, uh, we have a plethora of tools today to learn. We have Ansible, we have Docker, we have yep. Kubernetes. Yes, but I think with platforms like Cisco DevNet, what Cisco DevNet should do now is to write a roadmap for the future of native. Mm. I heard that. <laughs> I think, yeah, I agree. <laughs> yes, once we have a roadmap of the network engineer of the future, it, it will be easy for people to, to follow the steps, step by step, step by step. Mm -hmm. As you know, once you go online today, you have tons of videos, articles, and people get confused. They don't know where to start yep. and where they're going to, to end with their journey. That's why people are confused online. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Um, I'm hoping that we're going to do something uh, where we can have like our own, not just roadmap, but like have the content in there. Like, oh, complete yeah. this module, you know. Um, what I thought was a little bit interesting too is that uh, the CCNA, right, has uh, the AI programmability component of it. I don't know if you saw that that came out, that the CCNA content changed. Did you, did you see that? Yes, uh, I saw the change when, when Delodon published yeah. the change. Yes. Um, yes. So it's, it's kind of interesting that uh, that component's being put immediately in the CCNA at what's considered like the foundational certification, and then DevNet is like a separate thing. You know what I mean? I think, the, the, I think even us as leaders in network engineering are trying to figure out, okay, how important is it that you know this stuff early on? Yes, in my opinion, uh, I think it's a great opportunity for people who start the CNA because the CCNA is the gateway to yes. network engineering. Yes. I, I remember even when I started my journey in 2015, uh, my first networking courses was CCNA. And with the change we have now in the industry, as soon as you have the foundation of networking engineering, Embracing AI will not be a challenge because you know what you have to do. Maybe the biggest problem in the industry now is we are so worried and we don't see the opportunity. Yeah. If yeah. Yes. If you're a network engineer, you have to know, okay, I'm a network engineer and how can I apply AI in my daily routine tasks and when? I think those are the two questions network engineers should ask themselves daily. What about, um, I know that you mentioned uh, learning secure coding practices somewhere after learning automation AI. 
Uh, where does cybersecurity knowledge in general come in, do you think? Like, do you think that network engineers should learn any cybersecurity concepts besides secure coding practices? Yes, you know, uh, when I observe the industry, uh, for most people, even when you go on LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, when we talk about security, cybersecurity, most of people think you should be an hacker, you have to wear a hoodie, you have to like all the time. Yeah. But the secret in technology is the processes. If you don't understand the processes, it's going to be difficult for you to, to go ahead in the industry. Workflows are very important to, to understand. I know not all the network engineers will learn cybersecurity on a technical perspective. Mm -hmm. yes. You have people who can learn pen testing, uh, cyber ops, those, yes, I know the cyber ops, pen testing is too technical, but when you went on compliance, I think network engineers who don't want to code all the time, writing script should go on compliance, learning how the hyper compliance works, the GDPR. Yes, I think it's going to be important for, for network engineers to learn network uh, cybersecurity on the two sides, mm -hmm. technical or no technical. Sure, sure, sure. Yes, because you know, at the end of the day, all we do is workflows. Right. Um, I th I'm, I'm just looking at my uh, notes here because I see we're, we're running out of time. Um, I, think, I think the only other big thing I wanted to ask, um, I know you touched on this a little bit, but what recommendations do you have for someone uh, who wants to be a secure coder? Where do they need to go or what do they need to start practicing? Do you have just like a few quick tips? Yes. Uh, secure coding practices is like automation. You know, with automation, you can't automate what you don't understand. And with secure coding practices, I know uh, people should start first with programming languages like Python. You can learn JavaScript. I know JavaScript is most used in web development. You have CSS, HTML. Once you understand how you write the scripts on a particular language, it will be easy for you now to understand how you are going to secure your code. And the second step is to learn some concepts. What is King, what is XCSS, what is OAP, top 10. Now I know on Cisco DevNet we have the 10, 10, top 10 OAS for LLMs. I know this is the right way to go. You have to learn first your languages, your, a particular language you want, then security concept. After security concept, we have some platforms online like Secure Code Warrior. I know Secure Code Warrior was provided in 2021 by Cisco DevNet during Cisco Live. And this is the place where you can go to train yourself. And once you go on Secure Coding World, it's going to be easy. I know it's challenging in the beginning. It's no. easy to edit your script. And at the end, you may be unable to secure the script. Because once you write your script, it's good. Maybe someone knows better what to write. That's why mm -hmm. secure coding practices is super important. Right. Um, well, thank you so much. Uh, for, for we, I feel like we covered a lot of different topics, which I expected because you, you know and are interested in a lot of things. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, for everyone listening, uh, you can read Verlaine's stories on Hacker Noon. Um, he's also active on X or Twitter. Uh, what is that handle? Valen Devnet. Valen at Valen is it underscore Devnet? I think. Yes, underscore Devnet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and also on LinkedIn, uh, he shares content there as well. Uh, Valen, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today and dropping your knowledge. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Rico, for having me. And I suggest people to learn every day with the DevSec voice. This is the place. Oh, thank you. Oh, I appreciate it. I mean, we're just getting started, but I hope I hope it'll be valuable. I mean, I would say the same thing about 
you and, and your social media platforms. Like this guy is where you want to go to be inspired. You know, all this stuff he was saying about learning and adapting and push past the resistance. You're like, yeah. you're like that idea personified. So definitely, definitely follow Verlaine. <laughs> yes, adaptability is key. <laughs> right. Um, thanks again, and we'll see you in the next episode. Bye. Bye. Thank you.